in the days when Radio 1 started back in the 60s, there were probably 60 or 70 singles a week, plus 30 or 40 albums coming out every week. And every producer working in the main field of popular side of Radio 1 had to listen to all of these records every week and decide which three or four they were going to add on to their particular programme. So there's an awful lot of duplication between different producers doing this. So the vogue for the playlist came and went from at different times, but when there was a vogue to have a playlist, the idea was to rationalise it so that all of the daytime shows would add the same records and not overexpose one particular record and underexpose others. So there was a logicality about it. Um, of course, you could do it all by computer these days, and they do, don't they? But in those days, it was all done with strips of paper and the, 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 the what was it called? The strip system, that's right. They, 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 like the Jimmy Young show would have a, a piece of preformed A4 with slots on it where various pieces of paper would be put in with the titles of records or the sessions that had been recorded for that week. So it was a rationalisation thing. Needle time. Yeah, yeah, it goes back to the days of the pirates. The pirate radio was hugely successful because they could play, they didn't pay any copyright fees for the performance. Now, the performance in a record is owned by the, the music publisher, the writer, and the performer, of course. And uh, there are various international agreements whereby the people who do legal broadcasting, namely the BBC and Radio Luxembourg, and commercial stations these days pay for the rights to broadcast them. And there was always a great deal of discussion about how much should be paid because what is the value of airtime and, and so on. So needle time was time spent playing commercial gramophone records as opposed to non-needle time, which was film soundtrack or records in their first week of release were accepted from from needle time. But th that's basically what it was. It was the, the music that you played off commercial records and there was a great limitation on it because the Musicians Union for a start regarded the BBC as a primary employer of, of British musicians and thought it had a duty to give as much work as possible to their members so they wanted to keep music live, that was their idea. And then the record companies themselves thought that if they had overexposure it wouldn't help the sales and it would damage the sales. Then other people in record companies thought the more exposure they could get, the better. So it was a, it was a nonsense, really. It was the major constraint. That was what made Radio 1 different from the Pirates when it started. What made it more acceptable was the fact that we had jingles and we had a lot of good sessions and we had a lot of very big-name disc jockeys, but we didn't have unlimited needle time. Why the Breakfast Show was a success, which I produced the first ever programme on Radio 1 with Tony Blackburn, was that it had 100% needle time. And Tony Blackburn and I had a good idea of what would appeal to the public, which was lots of hits, lots of Tamla Motown oldies, only the best new records that were coming out, and maybe one or two country records, because I was a country fan, but that was always a source of disagreement between Tony and myself. And, you know, a lot of repetition and a lot of plugs for Tony Blackburn, so he became as well known as, as the radio station. I mean, I think Noel Edmonds was probably the most successful breakfast show presenter. Everybody remembers Tony Blackburn, but Noel was just enormous. You know, I mean, he was so inventive and original. Of course, he didn't care about music very much, did he? That was one of the big dis I remember John Peel being terribly upset that Noel didn't even own a record player. <laughs> I've got a lot of time for John. I knew him. Not many people know this, but it, it's in the book, so we can talk about it now. I went out to see Pirate Radio when it was operating, before Radio 1 started, and uh, Peel was there on the ship, lurking in the background. So I'd known Peel right from the beginning, before he joined. And he was terribly posh when he first started, you know, because he went to a public school, but he changed that accent and lost, lost all that when he came back. His father was a cotton broker. And... Um, he sort of made a name for himself with the perfume garden on the pirate ship. So my friend Bernie Andrews started this programme called Top Gear. And he tried a variety of presenters, which I think um, John Peel, Pete Drummond, maybe it was Tommy Vance, I can't remember, there were a couple of others. And the idea was a double-headed presentation of what we called loosely underground music, left field, not the commercial pop end, but more avant-garde music, music worthwhile in its own right. 
And Bernie was a particularly good producer who took a lot of time with his sessions and got good results. He wasn't copying commercial pop records. He was doing recordings of music that was worthwhile. And so Peel was one of the three presenters of this. And he wasn't at all popular with BBC management. They didn't like his druggy voice. They thought he was into drugs, which he never was, actually. And Bernie stuck his neck out and said, well, I've signed him for 13 weeks, so there's nothing you can do about it. So he got his knuckles wrapped. But, of course, Peel was then a big success. <laughs>